Happy Easter. 
want to welcome you today. I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist. My name's Pastor Brady. I want to welcome you to the first of our Easter services today. We have another one at 11 o'clock. And if you're visiting with us, do us a favor. Fill out that Connect card in the pew rack in front of you. We'd love to have record of your attendance with us today. And just want to thank you so much for being here. And if you didn't get any on the way in and during these next two songs, make sure if you're a believer in Christ that you grab a communion cup from one of our deacons in the back if you did not do that when you came in this morning. So I just want to tell you from here on out, uh, obviously um, we are praising the fact that Jesus is our risen Lord. And uh, as a church family, we've been walking through this week the events of Holy Week. And so Today is the celebration of that. Today is a huge celebration for what Christ did for us in defeating the grave. And the tomb is empty, guys. And our Lord is risen. And so, as you can see, if you grabbed a bulletin on your way in, our sunrise service this year is much different than normal. Um, we understand and realize that as our church grows, we wanted to make our sunrise service more like a worship service so that those that might not be able to come back at 11, for whatever reason, you're still getting the Word. We don't want you to get a devotional thought. We want you to get the Word of God. And so, as you can see in your bulletin, our staff, in a few moments after we stand and sing, we're going to actually read all four accounts of the resurrection from the gospel writers so that we can think about that and reflect upon that. And then Pastor Chris is going to come, and he's going to bring resurrection reflections, and I'll bring a word of remembrance as we uh, go to the Lord's table and have communion this morning. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Let's prepare our hearts. Please don't think, oh, this is just sunrise. This is just a little thing. This is setting our hearts for the rest of the day. We've got breakfast, we've got Sunday school, and we've got more worship ahead of us. Let's make sure that we get it started off right. Thank you for being here this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity that we get ready to sing the fact that you live. And Lord, there's another well-known song that goes, My Redeemer Lives. And Lord, the only reason that we can be a Christian is because the grave is empty. There is no other religion that has this unique occurrence with the Savior being alive. God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and to worship. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to invade our presence today, not just for sunrise, but for worship and for Sunday school and for breakfast. Father, help us to start our day off right by worshiping you this Easter. Thank you for defeating death. Thank you for saving our souls. Lord, help us to sing like we believe it. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Why don't you stand with us as we sing, He Lives.
children, Christ the Lord is risen today. Matthew 28, 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the, sto rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. And he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers and go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Mark 16, 1 through 8. <clears throat> when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. <clears throat> and very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Luke 24, 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went inside, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seem like an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tombs, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. John chapter 20. <clears throat> now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter, and the other disciple here is John, he's talking about himself, outran uh, Peter uh, following him, and they went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth which had been set or which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. When the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stood to look into the tomb, stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had and when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now I'm going to read verses 24 through 29, and this is where we'll be during the 11 a.m. worship service. Now Thomas was one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, so one week later, his disciples 
disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. All right, again, good morning. The significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every spring, millions of people around the world acknowledge in some form or fashion that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead some 20 centuries ago. Modern society calls it Easter. The origin of this term is uncertain, though it is commonly thought to derive from Easter, E-A-S-T-R-E, the name of a Teutonic spring goddess. The term Easter in the King James Version of the Bible in Acts 12, 4, is a mistranslation. The Greek word is Pascha, P-A-S-C-H-A, correctly rendered Passover in later translations. In fact, though Pascha is found 29 times in the Greek New Testament, it's only rendered Easter once, even in the King James Version. We ought to be glad, however, that multitudes usually caught up in pursuits wholly materialistic will take at least some time for reflection upon the event of the Savior's resurrection. It's entirely appropriate that Christians take advantage of this circumstance. We should be willing and able to explain both to our friends and family, at least who, those who have reverence for Christianity, the significance of the Lord's resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the foundation of our belief as Christians in 1 Corinthians 15, 44. Because if there is no resurrection, Christianity is a hoax and we are wasting our time. But the truth is, the event of Jesus' resurrection is incontrovertible. Professor Thomas Arnold, a world-renowned historian, once said that Christ's resurrection from the dead is the best attested fact in human history. This being the case, just what is the significance of Jesus' resurrection? Let's think on some of these matters. First, the resurrection is one of the major pieces of evidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Paul affirmed that Christ was shown to be the Son of God by his resurrection in Romans 1.4. Secondly, Jesus' resurrection represents an assurance that we can have forgiveness for our sins. And 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, If Christ had not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. Third, the resurrection tells the world that the kingdom of God is ruled by a living sovereign. The founder of Islam is dead and his bones lie dormant in the earth. But the founder of Christianity, 60 years after his death, appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos and said, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. Revelations 1.18. Fourth, Jesus' resurrection proves that physical death is not the termination of human existence. God, who is the giver of life, has the power to reanimate the human body. Christ's triumph over the grave is heaven's pledge to us that we, too, shall be raised. This is why Jesus is referred to the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Christ was raised as the first of that harvest. Fifth, the Lord's resurrection previewed the ultimate victory of Christianity over all its enemies. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is depicted as a lamb who has been slain, but was standing again, chapter 5, verse 6. This same Lord was the lion 
of the tribe of Judah that had won the victory. Chapter 5, verse 5. Christians, too, will overcome because of the Lamb's sacrifice and victory over death. And they defeated him by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12, 11. The resurrection of the Son of God should be a constant reminder to us of these wonderful biblical truths. And today we honor our master's victory over death, not once a year, but every day and every week. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for that reflection. I want to speak to you this morning briefly. As he spoke about resurre- or reflection, I'd like to speak about remembrance. I want us to remember the resurrection. I want us to remember what it means for our lives. And hopefully you'll plan on joining us at 11 o'clock. We're going to be studying John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29 with a sermon entitled Revelations from the Resurrection. I want to talk to you this morning about reactions from the resurrection. As we remember the resurrection, we need to remember how the different players involved reacted. And our staff just did an excellent job of reading all four accounts. So you've heard all four accounts of the resurrection. All four are a little little different, but if you're with us Wednesday, hopefully you remember that all four accounts complement one another. They do not contradict each other, but they complement one another. And so I'm just going to read two verses, and I'm in John 20, and we've already he read John 20, but I'm going to go back and look at a few of these verses as we talk about reactions from the resurrection. First, look at uh, verse 10 with me. John 20, verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Okay, that's how the disciples responded, all right? They've gone to the tomb, John and Peter. They've looked in. The uh, Bible literally says stooped, and the Greek word for that literally means to lean pretty much all the way in like this, right? Not to stop, but to stoop, right? There's a difference there. And so now, let's look at verse 18. So we see how the disciples reacted to the resurrection. I want you to see how Mary responded. Look at verse 18. Mary Magdalene went and announced, Announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. The question I want to ask you this morning is this What kind of reactions do those who first saw that the tomb was empty have? What are the reactions? What, what kind of feelings do we get here in the text? Well, very quickly this morning, number one, the disciples ran to comfort. The disciples ran to comfort. Look again at verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes. To me, the first nine verses of John chapter 20 are interesting. After Mary alerts Peter and John, and like I said earlier, the other disciple is John. He never refers to himself in the first person plural in the Greek. He always says the other disciple. And I think it's interesting that John puts himself first. I'm not doubting John's physical speed to get the tomb but he puts himself first every time in the resurrection saying the other disciple arrived at the tomb first congratulations John I I think that's great but look at verse 9 of John 20 for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead let me remind you that these disciples spent three years with Jesus and John and Peter specifically are what we call the inner ring of disciples they were the closest they were at the transfiguration they had seen things that nobody else had seen and then verse 9 says that they did not understand the scripture You can spend so much time around God and not in God that you know a whole lot without knowing anything. And when that happens, our reaction to what God is doing is going to be to run to comfort. And see, that's what happens here. They did not make the connection of the tomb being empty. In their minds, the fact that the tomb was empty, that fact, it should have said, oh, wait a second, he said something about this, right? How many times in your home do you think about doing something? You're like, my wife said something about that, right? And then it comes back to you, and you think about it, but the connection never occurred. They went to their homes, And if you look at verse 19, and we'll look at this in the second service, but John 20, verse 19, shows us that the disciples had locked the doors. Why? Because they were afraid of the Jews. They were afraid that they would be harmed. 
So no matter where the disciples are, they seem to be in fear. Now, don't get me wrong. I totally believe that John ran home to tell, remember that Jesus said on the cross, behold your mother, right? So John took Jesus' mother to his home. I am absolutely certain that John ran in the home and said, Mary, guess what? Your son is alive. The tomb is empty. I don't know where he's at, but it's empty. Right? And so I believe that happened, but here's the thing. He shouldn't have stayed home. Because of the way that John writes the rest of the gospel, it seems that all the disciples, including John and Peter, are staying locked up in a room because they're afraid. And they have the greatest news in the world. I am so glad that they told, I'm assuming that they told people when they got home. But what good is that going to do if you don't let the missionaries in the home go be missionaries in the world. So what we read from the gospel accounts, it seems that the message that our Lord was risen stayed in the comfort of homes. Jesus was walking around with them again before his ascension. As a human being, we have two possible reactions. We either run to comfort or we do what Mary did in verse 18. So they ran to comfort. The second thing you need to see is that Mary, she responded by calling. And what I mean by that is calling for others to know about Jesus. Look at verse 18. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Mary Magdalene does not run to the comforts of home. And I want to remind you, the culture and the context with which John 20 is written, women were not allowed to speak as freely as they are today. And there in the Jewish society, it would not be normal for a lady to walk down the street and be talking. That was not a a normal occurrence. But Mary Magdalene does not care because she has seen the greatest thing of her life. And you and I let so many things stop us from telling others about the greatest thing that has ever happened. I love what Pastor Chris said. He said that we should celebrate every day and every week. So that includes when we're tired. That includes that we don't feel like it. That includes all of these different things. When you have a true encounter with Christ, you can't keep it in. When you have a true encounter with Christ, the only thing you can do is go and tell others. Because you're about to burst. The way you and I react to the gospel reveals what you and I believe about the gospel. We don't take take our blanket and go home. We take our Bibles and go to the world, right? I mean, we go tell everybody that we can. If you're truly saved, if you've been touched by God, then you'll want to call others to him and not run home. The English word announced in verse 18 comes from the Greek word angelo. And angelo literally means to tell. And that's where we get our word angel from, right? The angel were to tell and to announce and so that word is used here and that is the only time in the Greek New Testament that this word is actually found the disciples heard the news and reacted by going straight home Mary though had a face to face interaction with the Lord and she rushes to tell the disciples as we get ready to transition to communion this morning I need to ask you where you stand where do you stand when it comes to Jesus Do you rush to tell others about the Lord after having an intimate time of prayer with him? Do you rush to tell others about the Lord when you've experienced a move of God in a worship service? Maybe it's your own personal Bible study time. I mean, when you're reading, you're like, wow, I I need to tell somebody about this theological truth. Maybe somebody that doesn't know. Maybe somebody that does know. But you need to tell somebody. Or do you respond like the disciples? Oh, I had a great day at church. I'm going to go home now. Oh, man, Easter service was awesome. Monday morning comes, somebody said, how was your weekend? Oh, we went to the ball game Saturday. Or we went to this new restaurant Friday night. Have you been there? Do you not remember what happened yesterday being today? Easter. Church, and and we should be excited about that because church is the bride of Christ, the gathering together. Or are you going to respond like Mary Magdalene? And are you going to tell everybody you know? 
This morning, we've very briefly reflected, we've remembered, and we've looked at how the disciples and Pastor Chris have pointed out, I believe, five very important things about the resurrection. And I've only pointed out two. We, we see the disciples ran to comfort. We see Mary responded by calling. But now we've gotten to the point where you and I have to reflect on what Jesus did at Calvary's tree. We have to reflect upon this because the tomb is empty because of what Jesus went through on Good Friday. I hope you're able to read our Good Friday devotional, our our video where, where we explain that. But I believe there's four things that we need to remember as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Before we get to these four things, and, and I go over these four every time because I think they're all scriptural and they're all important. But one thing to remember is that you cannot take part in communion if you are not a Christian. Because how can you remember something that you don't believe in? You need to have had that time where you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You've admitted to God you're a sinner, believed in Jesus as the Son of God, and confessed Him with your lips. Now that we do disposable cups, nobody has to be embarrassed. If you're not a Christian, just don't worry about it, right? You know, back when you used to pass the plates, if you didn't take it, you know, you'd feel bad. You also don't need to take part in communion this morning if there's sin in your heart that you're not willing to repent of. We're going to have a time of invitation before we take part in communion, and I'm going to give you time. Pastor Chris and I will be up here, but I will give you time to get right with the Lord. If we need to sing the song five times, we'll do it. Whatever it takes for you to get right with God this morning. Four things we need to think about when we take the Lord's Supper. Number one is self-examination. According to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. During this invitation, you need to examine your heart. Were there some things that you thought about yesterday or maybe even this morning or maybe some things that you said, you need to take that to the Lord. You need to ask God to forgive you of your sin. Secondly, that leads us to confess our sins. During this time of invitation, we need to examine our hearts, but we also need to confess our sin where God reveals that there is sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's nothing that you can do other than denying the Lord Jesus Christ that will keep you out of heaven. So if you have a sin, come. Come to the altar. Stay where you are. You don't have to go to me or Pastor Chris. You go straight to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. The third thing we need to do when it comes to the Lord's Supper is recommitment. Every day you should be recommitting your life further and closer to Christ and not farther away. Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You have a spiritual obligation, if you're a Christian, to recommit your life to Christ every day. Just because you're in the world doesn't mean you're of the world. So, during this time of invitation, we need to examine our hearts. We need to confess our sins. We need to recommit. And here's the last one and the most controversial one in Baptist life is restoring relationships. If you have a problem with somebody, whether in the room or you have a problem with somebody out there that's not here today, guess what? You need to restore that relationship before you take part in communion. And if you need to sit out today, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. That means that you're trying to obey 1 Corinthians 11 verse 27. You don't want to take part in an unworthy manner, right? We don't want to do that. Look at Matthew 5, 23 through 24. So if you're offering your gift at the altar there and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. You say, well, pastor, that person's not here today. Hey, during the time of invitation, why don't you go out in the welcome center and call them? Make things right. Make things right. You say, pastor, I don't like that. It makes me uncomfortable. That's countercultural. Isn't that what the gospel is? Shouldn't the gospel make us uncomfortable, make us change, and make us go against the grain? If you have beef with somebody, it could be in the room. You can grab them. You can go pray. Whatever you need to do, but you need to restore any relationships that might be broken.
before you take part in communion. And make sure that that relationship between you and the Lord is complete. Not complete because of anything you've done, but complete because of everything he's done for us. So I'm going to pray. Our praise team's going to come. Pastor Chris and I will be up front if you, if you need anything. But we need to make sure that we get our hearts right during this time of invitation before we take part in communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this opportunity to come and to take part in the Lord's Supper at your table. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody on the sound of my voice that is not saved, Lord, that they would come and they would want to accept you as their Lord and Savior, that they would grab one of our hands and say, I want to know Jesus. Lord, for the believers that are in this room, may we realize that taking part in communion is a serious thing. It is remembering what you have done through your body and through your blood. So God, whatever we need to do to get our hearts right, may we do that during this time. Whether that's confessing our sins, examining our hearts, recommitting, or even going across the room or in the Welcome Center to restore relationships. Let's make sure that we do business with God. Let's do it with you. In Jesus' name.